there's a fire broke out over there. You left the stove on and there's the fire extinguisher over there. You don't just sit around talking about it. You get up, you grab that fire extinguisher and you go put out the fire. Doing something right now and doing it fast makes sense when you know what to do. You could say that the world's on fire right now, so why are we sitting around? The problem is that we don't have a big enough fire extinguisher. We don't know what to do. The situation that the world faces is more like you see a fire there and over there and over there and everywhere. All the buildings in the neighborhood are on fire and you just have a fire extinguisher. Are you going to run into that inferno and start spraying it around knowing that it won't do any good. Probably what you need to do is to tell everybody. And then what if people don't believe you? You're like, hey, look, flames, smoke, look, the neighborhood's on fire. And they're like, if a neighborhood were really on fire, then everybody would be in an uproar about it. But they're not. Everybody's talking about Kim Kardashian's underwear, you know, or lack thereof. If the world were really on fire, if global warming were really that much of a threat, if the situation at Fukushima were really that bad and deforestation, if the oceans were really being emptied of fish, people wouldn't be talking about all those kinds of things. We're surrounded by these signifiers of normality, which makes it hard even for ourselves to believe that the world is on fire. So in those situations, what do you do? What happens when people don't listen to you? What happens then when you realize maybe that the way you're talking to them is turning them off? Like maybe there's something inside of you and maybe the world being on fire reflects something inside of yourself too. So then, then you are called to do spiritual work maybe, to do work on the level of relationship, the level of communication. Sometimes we realize that all of the things that we've been doing are just contributing to the problem. It's like a man running around a maze and he's, he's desperate to get out and he's running faster and faster and he's not getting anywhere. He's hitting dead ends. He's coming back to the center and a little voice in him says, dude, you just got to stop. You're not getting anywhere. But he says, no, no, no. If I stop, I'll never get out because I'm only going to get out if I use my feet. So I better keep running. But eventually he gets tired and he does stop. And when he does, and he pauses, he realizes that there's a pattern to this maze. And he begins to understand why he's been running in circles. And he realizes that there were other passages that he was running too fast to see. And then he can begin to follow a different path. I think that our civilization is stuck in these kind of habitual ways of doing things. For example, the paradigm of control of the technological fix. And we've got to stop. Let me give an example. So Sandy Hook happened last year, a school shooting. And the response was, well, we've got to make schools more secure. And people were, you know, should we do that with just more sophisticated locks? Should we have more metal detectors, security guards, arm the teachers, gun control? You know, like the solution to this, what looked like a failure of control was even more control. Now, in fact, this school already had way, way, way more security than any school had when I was in school. When I was in school, all the doors were open. Anyone from the community could walk in and out. How do we make them more secure? I mean, you know where we're headed. We're headed toward metal detectors and security screenings in every public building. Even if every building has that, we still won't be safe. There's a saying in Chinese about measures like that. They stop the gentleman, but not the thief. So maybe we need to stop for a minute. And when we do, a pattern emerges and a new passageway which could be, let's open up the school completely, perhaps. Let's try trust. Part of the transition is maybe a period of non-doing, 
you know, a period of latency, a period of, of stepping into the mystery and letting go of our habitual responses to things.